everybody, and welcome back to Manga Mavericks. Remember last week when we asked people, hey, if you went to the Naoki Urasawa exhibit in Los Angeles, get, tell us how your experiences at the exhibit. We'd like to hear them. And guess what? We have someone who reached out to us to talk about their experiences at the Naoki Urasawa exhibit in Los Angeles. We have on with us Aiden, known on Twitter as Cowboy B-Boy, on to talk about his experience on the opening day of the Art of Noki Urasawa exhibit at Japan House Los Angeles to talk about all the fun stuff he did there and what it was like to see Naoki Urasawa present in person. Thanks for coming aboard, Aiden. Hello. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to be able to talk about this. Uh, like, Naoki Urasawa is my favorite manga artist of all time, so the event was a surreal opportunity and it was just just incredible and i'm really excited to be able to talk about it can i i just want to put out there for the record right that um aiden actually reached out to us uh before we put up that particular episode so I know. like he could read our minds he was able to <laughs> listen to an episode that hadn't even been released yet it it did take me a second because I think I was like halfway through editing that episode when Aiden uh, messaged us, and I was just I I really had to kind of take a moment to be like, did did I put that episode up? Yet? <laughs> Aiden must have some cl weird clairvoyant powers, like friend or Johan, <laughs> in which he can like somehow know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably. Um, so I guess even before we talk about the exhibit, um, we sh we could probably talk a little bit about, like, kind of our experiences with Urasawa a little bit, just as far as, like, uh, I guess what our background is with his works in particular. And I, I hate to say that I've only ever read, um, I've only ever read, like, Pluto in full. I've, uh, wow. Urasawa, yeah, <laughs> Urasawa is somebody that I've kind of slept on, unfortunately, but... I've seen enough of his works that I know that I love them. Um, like I said just now, I like I've read Pluto all in full. I read that back when I was in high school, and I really loved it. Even as someone who had never really read like the original Astro Boy, I really got something out of it. Um, I've never read the monster manga, but I, I've seen I've seen a good portion of the anime back when it was on Sci Fi or whatever. Uh, back when Sci Fi actually aired anime. Um, but yeah, no, Urasawa is definitely somebody that like I really want to read, uh, where I want to read more of his works, and I, I definitely plan on fixing that at some point. Um, what 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 about you, Lum? Well, I am a big fan of Urasawa. I've read most of his works, at least I've read all of his works that have been translated into English officially, as well as a few others that have not. I first got into Urasawa's works thanks to my friends over at the Animation Revelation forums, who are big fans of his, Monster in particular, and their discussion of Urasawa's works intrigued me and made me want to seek out them out. And so I started with the monster anime back when that was on Hulu. I binged that in a week because it was so engrossing that immediately started reading on his manga like 20th Century Boys and the monster manga and Pluto and I've read a lot. I've read also Yawara. Uh, I'm a lot of Yawara, not like all of it that I think was scanlated. I've read all of Billy Bat, and that was amazing. I talked about Billy Bat on the show. Uh, when in the year it ended, I think I had his best manga ending of 2016, I think. I, I mentioned it on that podcast. I think so, so, yeah. Yeah, Billy Bat was an amazing one. But yeah, I have I really enjoy Urasawa's work, and I... I do you think he's one of the best storytellers in manga right now? Because his thrillers are just so engrossing and you, his mysteries are incredible page turners that just keep you in suspense from beginning to end. And Billy Bat, now that was a crazy ride where you could not predict where that thing was going, but it came together so beautifully. And I'm looking forward to reading his next works whenever they're hopefully brought over into English. Oh man, it makes me so so glad to hear how much you enjoyed the ending of Billy Bat because I know that that's one that has been controversial among fans whether or not they they appreciate it, and it's it's sad to hear that because I think that it is just just like you. I think it's 
one of the best endings I've read in a manga ever. I agree. I think it was just so perfectly in tune with the themes of the series. Exactly. It's it's a it's an ending that is more about the themes and the message of the manga rather than the individual events or the the characters. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. I think Urasawa is really great at exploring team to its fullest extent in his stories. And I think that all of his stories culminate in like coming to a culmination of the ideas he's exploring in a very uh, articulate and thoughtful way. Yeah, but uh, Aiden, I guess, uh, wh wh where did it all start with you? So the first of Urusawa's series that I actually read was Billy Bat a handful of years ago. I read it not long after it had been completed, just because I heard people talking about it, and I had become interested in his work, partially just because I'd seen it for years around, particularly images of Friend or, or Johan as, as villains that I'd heard people say that they really liked. And I had come up with the idea of cosplaying Friend to a convention because it is an easy costume. It is a suit and a tie yeah. <laughs> and a mask. So I I found a full set of the 20th Century Boys manga on eBay and ordered that. And it took quite a while to ship. So in the meantime, I read all of Billy Bat. <laughs> and then, then immediately after that, read 20th Century Boys and 21st Century Boys, the, the conclusion of it. And over the course of the next few years or so, uh, collected Monster and Master Keaton and read those, as well as uh, Pluto and other things. I've, I've read some of his other works that were scams, such as Yawara, what, like, what exists of it, since it's a terribly long series that never was never was completed. It's his longest. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous that his longest series was his first, like, major serialization. I mean, that and Pineapple Army were nearly concurrent, but, but yeah, and still... And a much different kind of story than what he's known for now. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, Pineapple Army, actually, I did get the the single graphic novel that Viz released in 1990 of it. Where nice. they, they put out ten chapters of Pineapple Army as individual comic books that weren't necessarily even the first ten chapters of the manga. They were just ten chapters from the first, like, twenty or so. And put them together in a, a graphic novel that was flipped back so that it would write, read in the opposite direction, had all of the sound effects redrawn, and all of the lettering was done by hand. I think it was one of the very first graphic novels that Viz Media actually even put out. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, so, but the, just from there, over the the past two and a half years or so since I started reading his works, they've just grown on me more and more, and I've read a number of them a few different times. Like, Billy Bat sadly still is not licensed in America, and I think that's uh, just an absolute shame, but I was able to purchase the entire series in Spanish and import it from Spain, since I can read Spanish, so it was a, a great way to both improve my, my language skills and own my favorite manga series. Yeah, so there's just, th there's a whole lot to love about his, his writing, as far as the the characters, the the stories, and the, the settings, just every, everything about them is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Oh boy, I really need to get on more Urasawa. Yes, um, you do. <laughs> it's uh, quite 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 the blemish on my manga fandom. Uh, so, I guess um, I guess we could just move on to talking about the exhibit. And um, I guess uh, we we don't really have any like particular talking points. At least I don't have any anyway. Um, I figured we could just kind of talk about your experience with uh, you know getting ready and actually getting to the venue and experiencing it and whatnot so just 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 kind of, just kind of run through run through your experience with us what was it what was it like getting ready and actually like uh being a part of the exhibit yeah so i had known that he was going to have his exhibition in los angeles this year from january 23rd to i think march like march 20 something this year 28 okay yeah i i knew that that was happening and i was actually thinking about heading out to Los Angeles for the exhibit on like, late in March when I have spring break for my college classes. And then I was at work and got a Discord message from a friend, who, and they said, hey, do you see that Urasawa himself is actually going to be at the exhibit in January, like when it opens? And I immediately thought, oh, oh, shit, I guess I'm going to have to go to Los Angeles in a week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that I've never done before, never traveled to California, never done that. I'm from the Midwest, and it just, it, it was impulsive, but it was the kind of thing where he is my favorite 
artist. Not just, like, my favorite mangaka or my favorite writer. He's just my favorite artist ever. And I never expected to have an opportunity to be able to actually see him speak, let alone meet him. So I, I didn't want it to pass it up. So just got together planning that. My father also went on the trip with me. He doesn't have any particular knowledge of, of Urusawa beforehand, but he said that he just would prefer to not have me go alone on a trip like that. But it was great having him along as well. So mm-hmm. Did he attend the exhibit with you? Yeah. Oh, what did he think of the art? He the the art in the exhibit was he he didn't have a an, a ton to say but after the uh the interview that was held that night with him he came away with a very deep appreciation for Urasawa's art and he was a person in his work ethic and it was just it really made me feel great to see uh like my my dad just learn and share this person that I love so much. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I I know the feeling. Uh, I've talked about it on the podcast before how like um, when 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 I started watching Monster on Sci Fi, my my dad took an interest, and we used to we used to watch it together every week for a while, at least until I just kind of stopped watching it for whatever reason. I I think I might have missed a DVR recording that week or something. I don't know, but I, I totally get that feeling. <laughs> my dad has never had any interest in anime, and the only anime my mom ever liked was Naruto. <laughs> <laughs> but she tried watching Oron, but she didn't like it. <laughs> well, that's a shame. We had a we had a VHS of the old Fox dub of My Neighbor Totoro several years ago, and that was the only anime I had ever watched up until I was probably like fifteen or sixteen. So it was interesting how that was the one thing that managed to worm its way into my household all those years ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that your dad walked away with an appreciation of Urasawa. Yeah, absolutely. It, it also helps that, that there's a, a general love of classic rock that is seen in a lot of his series, mainly 20th Century Boys, so that that's something that was really easy to, to talk about with. Um, so I guess in general, how, how, how was Los Angeles? Wow, it was very different from the Midwest, very very big. <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, I've been I've been to the East Coast a handful of times, places like New York, and it was a lot less crowded than I was expecting from a, compared to like New York City or Chicago. So that was that was nice. Uh, I got got all the important pictures, like getting a picture of the the Nicolas Cage Hollywood star. That was that was a good thing. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm sure it was just as cold as uh, as in the Midwest, right? Oh man, uh, yeah, no, no. I had to like drive through a, an actual life threatening blizzard to get to the the airport, so that was terrifying. Like, like nearly went off the road several times and got to emerge in seventy plus degree weather. So, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't we all love to escape to LA or somewhere in the southern part of the country to escape these harsh? Harsh weather conditions. It's been in the negatives all week. It's been snowing all week in Minnesota. It's awful. I was gonna say it. It feels so good to have another Midwesterner on the podcast to kind of to, just to share in our pain of the cold oh, in the winter <laughs> and how much we just despise it. It was funny it, touching down there. I, was, I just was thinking to myself, "Oh man, Los Angeles. This is this is where Kevin Yamagata lives." <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I just kept thinking about it through. I'm like, man, I, I don't know if any of those places in Billy Bat were actual actual buildings, but I don't think I'd be able to find them on my two days here in the city. But oh man, I'm, I'm in the same city where, where Billy Bat took place for part of it. <laughs> Did you see any Kevin cosplayers and get freaked out? It's like, whoa, he's real. <laughs> uh, not this might sound a bit weird, but I've looked online and. I think I might have been the only person to have ever done a Kevin Yamagata cosplay. I cannot find any others. Wow. That's a shame. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. But, yeah, no, that, that that was really great. So just got there on Tuesday night to, to get ready for the opening of the event on Wednesday. And, that yeah, they got to, got to the hotel and thought, okay, we're going to get up early tomorrow. We'll have a few hours to walk around before the 10 a.m. opening. So then, yeah, like at, at 10 a.m. on on Wednesday, we were able to to head up to the where the Japan House Gallery was, which is right on Hollywood Boulevard. Like the the Japan House is in the same block and the same like building, con- like connected conglomerate of buildings that like the the Chinese Theater and the Dolby Theater, and so it's where it's like this is where the Oscars take place, just just right there. 
And to, to start off the day, we, we saw signs at Japan House and went up there, and it was on the fifth floor of the area, and then we realized after it opened that, oh, this is actually just the Japan House's upstairs office where they're going to have the, like, like where they have talks and events. But we were able to talk with the with the receptionist up there, and he was very friendly and excited to talk about the, the exhibit with us, and uh, said that the actual event, or like, in the gallery would be downstairs on the second floor. But before we headed down there, he, he did mention, oh yeah, there we, ha- we had an event last night, it was a, like a VIP event, and I had, I'd seen a few pictures on Twitter about that. So they had um, the, the artist who draws the comic Snot Girl post about that. She had a, had a picture of Urasawa holding her book, and it was really, really incredible seeing that. The, the receptionist had even mentioned that they had a number of very big name Hollywood stars there that he was not expecting to see. And it was the kind of thing where this is a person who works in Hollywood in the same like block where the Oscars take place. And he seemed impressed by the the caliber of people who were there. And he was not allowed to say who it was. Although when I did mention the name Guillermo del Toro, there was a noticeable reaction from him and another (laughs) staff worker. So I have a suspicion that del Toro was in the building. I would not be surprised, honestly. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Which, he's another one of my favorite artists. uh, Man, just holding out hope that eventually, one day, he'll be able to make his monster show. Hopefully. Oh, man. Maybe he came to meet for to talk about it. Here's hoping. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Yeah. So then, but yeah, following that, we just went right downstairs to the opening of the gallery. It was a smaller gallery than I was expecting. But they were able to pack it just full of information and artwork. So the Japan House had a a large gift shop area full of just general Japanese items. It, it was more high end stuff than than you'd find at like a just a store. So it was not yeah. I mean, it was fancy, expensive stuff that I would never consider buying. <laughs> but so so was it hmm. so so they didn't they didn't just have like you know pocky or whatever. Oh no, it was. I mean, it, it's like. Well, you, you could get a bookmark for for fifteen dollars, kind of thing, and that's the low oh, end. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Although the book, there better be a good bookmark. They did have a bookmark that was the do 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 like sound effect, and it looked suspiciously like those of Hirohiko Araki in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It did not have <laughs> any like copyright info, but it's like, ooh, I can tell what you're going for with this. Hmm. Unlocked. Unlicensed JoJo sound effect bookmarks. Very interesting. <laughs> but no, it was very, very cool. Like, like just they all, they also had a small gift shop area full of Urusawa items. So the primary things were a number of postcards with his artwork on them. But then they also had some some fancier things, such as a sketchbook with with his artwork on the cover for the exhibition, like a canvas printed uh, artwork of Jigoro. Yawara's grandfather dressed in like a cowboy outfit and at a saloon, which <laughs> seemed like an odd fit, but hey, it was there. Um, they had Billy Bat tea towels and a Billy Bat drawstring bag, which did you get any of? Them? I I got a I got the Billy Bat drawstring bag. I was not expecting there to be actual Billy Bat merchandise, like dude, how we don't actually have Billy Bat over here. But I was very pleasantly surprised to see that, and. Uh, yeah, they also had T-shirts that were incredible, but they were seventy dollars. <laughs> <laughs> seventy dollars. But man, all of them were fantastic. They had one with Billy on it, one with Kana, and uh, one with a friend. And man, they looked they looked really really great. They just were a bit out of my price range. Man, if only we lived in the universe of one of our series, then I'm sure we could have probably got it a Billy Batcher for dirt cheap. <laughs> I know, <laughs> or even like there's like I I read 20th Century Boys again recently, and I noticed that there's one portion in a flashback to like the late 1980s where you see Kenji and another character, and this the other character is like shoplifting manga from a, a convenience store, and you see him shoplifting a volume of Pineapple Army and a volume of Yawara, and I'm like, what are the implications of this? Does Urasawa himself exist inside the the universe of 20th Century Boys? <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was that was really great. But uh, oh, to to just go back to the exhibition itself, there there were a bunch of different uh, like like marquees outside of the uh, the area where they had large display cases. 
with life-size printings of a number of the, the different characters. So they had Kenji from 20th Century Boys, uh, Jigoro and Yawara from Yawara. They had a television screen running the Billy Bat commercial that aired alongside the, the release of the final volume, and an actual Billy Bat sketch that Urasawa did with a, a marker before the opening of the event, like on the wall. So it was a and like signed and dated and everything. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. With, within the event itself... The general area had a number of different kiosks set up with different with with artwork on it, as well as uh, explanations of several of his series. So there would be things such as like timelines of when all of his series were running, such as how back in the eighties and nineties he would have two serializations running concurrently, which is just unbelievable. The the output that he had. And it was very cool to see the actual timeline of that, so you could line up and see which series were running at which time and how they compared with each other as far as uh, um, as that and like, which magazines they were running in. And a, a lot of different just displays talking about like manga in general as a medium and how different techniques can be used in manga, as well as uh, explanations of several different series. And then they also had the actual original artwork for several of the series that were displayed behind glass, but they also had English translations on top of them. So these were the the Nemu like name storyboards of the of the series. Although okay, maybe Nemu refers to the like earlier versions. I, I don't recall the exact terminology there, but from what I remember of Bakuman, I think so. I think that's an even rougher draft. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say I think it's basically just a rough draft or a manuscript. Okay, they did definitely have those. They had the the entire rough draft for the final chapter of Monster in a display case. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's amazing. And but yeah, so these were I think essentially actually second generation copies. So uh, so it, but it was it's a second generation copy of the original drawing, but it would be the one that has the the Japanese text that is printed and then cut out and pasted on top of the speech bubbles. And they did the same thing, but they also added the English text on top of that. So for some of the cases where the series had already been printed in English, such as 20th Century Boys, Monster, and Pluto, they used the translations and lettering from the Viz Media releases, so they had those on there. Slightly, unfortunately, they used the, the versions from the previous editions of them rather than the perfect editions. So with with the perfect editions of both Monster and Twentieth Century Boys, they've updated the lettering, and it's uh, it's really really nice. In actually, in both cases, it's done by a letterer named Steve Dutro, who is one of my favorite letterers in the business, and he uses a font that is custom to himself. Like you're you're not going to see that font from any other letterer, and it it just looks really really good. So. I was a little bit sad that they, they used that, but honestly, you're not there for the lettering. You're there for you're there for the artwork, and it it was very very cool. But then on top of that, which this is what I think is one of the most exciting parts of the entire exhibit, is that they had translations of several of his works that have not been officially released in English yet, and some of them haven't been translated at all. So they had they had like uh, chapter seven of Master Keaton Remaster, which is the the single volume continuation for Master Keaton that he worked on in 2012 and 2013, that takes place 20 years after the end of Master Keaton. So it's kind of like a, a really nice catch up on where, where the characters are at 20 some years later, and you get to see them all older and stuff. So they had uh, a chapter where Keaton gets to meet up with his daughter Yuriko again and it, it was re really cool to be actually able to actually just read that entire chapter with the original artwork nice yeah and the same thing goes for other series such as uh Muji Rushi the sign of dreams and Yawara oh yeah Muji Rushi that's good yeah so like, like with Yawara they even are going to be switching out the exhibit every two weeks so it runs for uh, around eight weeks, and they're going to be switching out that story every two weeks to kind of mirror the serialized format. So I don't remember, I don't know the exact positioning of the chapter, but they, the chapter that was on display was from volume 29, which is the final volume. So I'm guessing that it will be the final four chapters of Yawara that will be on display. Hmm. Nice. They did something similar, like with, it wasn't always the first chapter. Sometimes it was the first chapter, sometimes it was a mix of them. 
With Monster, they showed a, a good mix of chapters, including the final chapter. So it, it had to, a few people who were standing around talking about it were cautioned, hey, don't maybe don't read that. That is the end of the series that they have up right there. <laughs> I'd be surprised if like any Urasawa fan came to the exhibit not knowing the ending of Monster. There were some, but like, and, like, like there were certainly people there who hadn't even heard of Urasawa since it's just right there in this shopping complex essentially there's a hot topic right across the the hallway from it <laughs> was the hot topic selling any earth uh, merchandise you know i didn't stop in there so i couldn't uh, say <laughs> maybe there they were had cheaper billy bat shirts <laughs> <laughs> look look when, when, when you when you have when you're a property especially an anime manga property that has a uh, licensed merchandise and hot topic you know you've made it big yeah, <laughs> there were a number of people who walked into the exhibit with hot topic bags. <laughs> oh, so like like some among the other things that they had there, they had a, a like this walkway that you could go through where they had um, printed on like long strips of uh, like signage material that was like like kind of floppy, but just uh, panels of of Urasawa's manga, and you could walk through it. Or go around it, and you, you could see them. And it had panels of all these different series. They had a, the a life size mannequin of friend the from twentieth century boys, and it was using the mask that was used in the actual live action movie trilogy for the movie. So it was the actual movie prop. Whoa, wow. that's really cool. It was really really cool seeing that up close because you could see the different like folds in the fabric and stuff like. I'd made a cosplay of that character a handful of years ago, and it was really difficult to try to actually mimic the the folded look of the fabric and make something that you could actually see through. And it was kind of nice and reassuring to see the mask used in the movies and realize, yep, there is there's absolutely no way that the actor was able to see through this mask. <laughs> <laughs> if they were blind, just like I was. <laughs> Even though he has the big eye painted on his mask, can't see anything. <laughs> Ironically, he can't see. Um, so was this? A, I, I'm not sure if this matters at all um, because I've, I've never been to an event like this, so I don't know for sure. So, what, what was this the kind of thing that you had to like get a ticket to, or was this something that like anybody could just kind of walk in and just look at all the pretty pictures? The art exhibit itself is completely free. It's just right there in the. In like the the shopping center, so you can walk right into it. There were, I, there were definitely people there who had no idea what it was. They just saw the, uh, they're, they, one of the big pieces of signage that they have in the front of the Japan House gift shop. There, the it was artwork from the, a cover of I think Volume Seventeen of Twentieth Century Boys, where it has Kenji and some of his friends saying, "Hey, come look at this," and it's just <laughs> kind of like beckoning you into the to look at the shop and and the exhibit. So. It was it was really interesting seeing people walk in who very obviously did not understand what it was, but did still, still take a look at everything. Hmm, that, nice. That's pretty neat. One of the items that they like the the display things that they had was a display of all of the of, of a bunch of different foreign versions of Urasawa's releases. So they had a map of the world along with um, lists of what has been licensed in which area. So you get to see. All these countries that have Billy Bat, well, we still don't. <laughs> Man. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, they also had a, a, a number of like paperbacks there. So it was very cool seeing like the, the alternate covers used throughout the, the world. Sadly, we weren't able to open them. I would have really, really liked to see what the like the editing and lettering would look like on some of these. They had like a Polish copy of Pluto and... Mm. Like mm. Indonesian copy of Monster, and it, oh man, it was, it was very very cool seeing all of those, and you could tell that some of them were even fairly old. Like I think the Spanish copy of Pineapple Army that they have there looked like an, an older publication. There were uh, also sketches from Urasawa's childhood, so they had one that was listed as the earliest known surviving artwork from his childhood. So it was a a drawing of like Tetsujin twenty eight from he was from when he was six years old. Oh, that's oh my a, gosh! That that's that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, like other various um, like manga manuscripts that he drew as a child, like in uh, like 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 composition notebooks, and and other pieces pieces of artwork. And what what was very very cool about it is that like when when reading Twentieth Century Boys, I always got the feeling that the character Kenji had a lot of influence was influenced a lot by his own childhood because 
they were both born in 1960, and it shows him like growing up and like playing with his friends and drawing these pictures and stuff. And it's like, wow, this 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 feels like it has a lot of parallels to to Rosella's life itself. And uh, if you looked closely at the manuscripts for 20th Century Boys that they had on display, there was one that displayed a chapter where it showed. Kenji's drawing in the Book of Prophecy within the story, and it showed the the giant robot. And Hmm. you look at it, and you realize that that picture of the giant robot wasn't something that was drawn for the manga. It was an extra piece of paper that was on the manuscript that was all yellowed and old, and while there was no note specifically saying it, it seems almost certain that that was actually one of Naoki Urasawa's childhood drawings that he just incorporated into the manga. Oh my god. That is yeah. an amazing revelation. That's actually some a design he came up with as a kid that he reused for 20th Century Boys. That's awesome. Oh yeah, and on a, on a on a similar note with 20th Century Boys, uh, the perfect editions were started getting released in America just last year, which have like like the double volumes with the colored pages and everything, and they're very nice. And I I noticed when I, when the first one came out that there was an extra speech bubble added to the very first chapter. So there's the like within the first few pages of the manga, Kenji plays the record twentieth century boy over the loudspeakers of his middle school. He was expecting it to cause some revolution and be this amazing revelatory event that would lead the school into an age of rock and roll, and he just was kinda sad that it didn't. And there it says, I expected everything to change, but but nothing did. But there was an extra speech bubble added into that that page in the perfect edition that says and yet, dot, 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 which holds a lot of significance to the story, especially once you, you know some of the later events. And I, like, I noticed that when I compared the books, but at the event, they had that page there, and it was like the original page that he had colored. And if you look closely at it, that speech bubble there is actually pasted onto the page in Japanese. So you, you see the, the bubble itself being added like physically to the page. And since the, the lettering that was used in the exhibit is the lettering from the, the previous Viz release, it doesn't include that bubble. So that one was left in Japanese, a bit of an outlier compared to all of the other ones that were translated. And sure enough, if you look at the, the final color page of the first chapter of 20th Century Boys in the Perfect Edition, you can see a little seam around that box where it was actually pasted on. So when they scanned it in for the, the release, you can see that difference there. Nice. That is pretty interesting. Yeah, like, so I think that, yeah, that that covers a lot of what was there at the exhibit. They also had just a number of very large prints of of different pieces of artwork. They had um, interviews with with, uh, a manga historian from Japan and a manga, or a comic critic from, from France, and various different pieces of concept art and sketches. Oh, okay. One of my favorites was there was a piece of like concept art for Billy Bat when he was brainstorming ideas, and if you you look at it, it it shows that it's closer to Mickey Mouse in in his design than what was eventually used to. Because I mean, it's 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 obvious that Mickey Mouse was the inspiration for the character of Billy, but he was also brainstorming ideas for the name of the character. So you see, Becky, Bobby. Booty, Billy, <laughs> the bat. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, I ju- like, <laughs> just, just, just think, just think of what could have been. We, we could have had Becky Bat or Booty Back. <laughs> booty Back. <laughs> booty Bat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe that's what we need to get licensed over here in America. Just rename it, rename it Booty Bat. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure that would bring in a lot of the younger crowd. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, come for the booty, stay for the, the wonderful message on the, the importance of comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, so but also, since it was the opening night of the of the exhibition for the public, they also were having a book signing and an interview that night. So the book signing was limited to the first fifty people to, to purchase a book from their shop, which was at five PM is when they were allowing books to be purchased. Although you could line up at three, so it ended up we ended up lining up like four separate times. It was like loitering around before three p.m. and like a bunch of people who obviously were very excited. And then at three p.m. we lined up for a little while, and they gave us cards, 
which we could sign our names on, and then that would give us a, a number in line. So then at 5 p.m., we lined up again in order, and uh, an attendant came around and looked at our cards and, and the names written on them, and then transcribed those into katakana characters to show how our name would be written phonetically in Japanese. Wow. And then we got through that, the, the 50 people got through the line and were allowed to purchase um, one of four different books. It was the first volume of the four different series that are licensed here. So 20th Century Boys, Monster, Pluto, and Master Keaton. And then finally, around 6 p.m., everyone was able to line back up for the actual signing event. Wow, that sounds really organized. Yeah, like, they're, they're, like it worked out really well. The, like, I'm really glad they had like the, the card system worked out, because otherwise it would have felt a little bit hectic. I mean, yeah, I need to have people staying there for two hours in line, probably clogging up traffic in the mall area. Yeah, definitely. But how many people lined up in total? Did you get to, like, see? Like, were there more than 50? I know that there were definitely more than 50 people there, but it seems like the, the people who were, were interested in getting a signature tended to get there earlier in the day. So there were not a ton of people who were looking for a signature that day that, that I saw who were unable to get one, though the actual talk that happened later that night was a lot more difficult to get into because that was something where they had free registration online. So you would just use Eventbrite to, to reserve a ticket for it. And I reserved a ticket the day that the event was announced, and my my dad reserved one the very next day, like at night. And we spoke with some other people who tried reserving tickets the same night that my dad did, and they were unable to. Whoa, wow. that filled up fast. Yeah, and since it was an event that was free to register for, there were quite a few people who did not show up. So it's it's not like they stopped me from registering, even though I hadn't planned out my trip yet so so there were definitely people who did not show up so they were able to let people in to the event after that which was nice and oh yeah like i had hadn't even like mentioned it but the the trans like the host of the event as far as the uh the moderator for the interview and also the translator who helped during the signings was frederick l shot he's the like just one of the most renowned manga translators ever I, like like one of the, the old guard of, of manga translation who worked on Pluto alongside Jared Cook and translated so many of Osamu Tezuka's works. Mm -hmm. A big Tezuka scholar. I have his book on, called the Astro Boy Essays. Fascinating read. Yeah. Before the signing occurred, he was just sitting out at a, a chair around like outside of the, the Japan house area. So I went up and spoke with him for about five minutes and it, he was incredibly pleasant and nice to talk to, and it was a really great, great time talking with him. I thanked him for his work on on various Tezuka things that I've read, and and on Pluto, and he he actually had a, a copy of Muji Rushi there as like personal reading material that he had been reading through. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was it was very. Neat. There were, there were some other people around my age who were, who were there and who were all just very excited. And I after I walked away after talking with him, one of the guys. Walked up. And he's like, "Wait, oh my gosh, is 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 that shot over there? Is is that, is that him? Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's very friendly. Why don't you go say hi? You're you're wearing a phoenix shirt, man. You, like he, he translated that, and he's like, oh, I, I can't do that. I'm uh, I, oh, I can't. But oh man, it was it was it was very one of the the coolest things about the entire event was just being surrounded by people who cared so much about Urasawa." Yeah, like like even in my experiences with going to anime conventions, not a ton of people know Urasawa stuff. Like like I cosplayed the friend, and two people or so knew who I was. And it's oh. despite despite his acclaim, he's not he's not exactly mainstream when it comes to like like cosplay character recognition. Yeah, I mean I could see that. He's beloved by comics critics and like people well worst in manga, but to the general anime fan, probably because a lot of his works haven't been adapted into anime and like widely distributed, like they might not know him. Yeah, it also doesn't help that like if you're if you're cosplaying any of his characters, they tend to just wear like very plain normal clothes. <laughs> Friend has his mask, but other than that, it's like, oh, oh, what what is what does Kevin Yamagata wear? Well, he wears slacks and a white shirt. I think Kenji has a unique look, especially like in the third act of the series. Oh yeah, certainly. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so the with, with the the signing, we were able to, to to walk up there and give him the book that we had for for signing. It was all, you couldn't bring anything else from the outside. No, no other books of his. No fan art. It was only the the books that were purchased there, which is, seems like a reasonable reasonable thing. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And but then but then he uh, so I was sitting there and just was incredibly friendly to everyone and, and smiling and, and shaking hands and he would write the person's name in katakana also draw the the friendship symbol from 20th century boys and then sign his name on it and we could speak with him briefly and uh fred was there to translate so like i didn't have a question or didn't didn't feel right asking something that might take too long so i just simply said thank you for writing manga that has changed my life and i i really do think by the way he reacted that he understood what i said before it was even translated and it just it made me so happy oh that, that's nice that's amazing yeah like while while now Hirosawa doesn't speak english i he does have some understanding of the language itself yeah it's it's, it's nice to see that he, he 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 seemed to understand your message which which is great yeah so it was just that was just surreal and and amazing and i think that takes us to up to the the final portion of the day though which was the actual interview with him so that that took place upstairs on the the fifth floor area that that i had gone to at the beginning of the day and it was a room i think around 200 people were able to be seated in it and urusawa sat up on the the stage alongside uh, frederick Schott, who moderated it and there was also another interpreter there so uh, fred said he's like oh man it's it's nice that i don't have to to handle translation the whole time i can i can understand you but i can just just sit back and relax this time <laughs> <laughs> and uh from there it was a general inter interview about just his experiences with manga and how he got started and relaying some things about how he just he, from a young age just always was drawing and just just something he always loved doing and yeah, he said he you draw like 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 manga when he was maybe like six to seven eight years old, and his one of his uncles saw it, saw it. He's like, "Oh man, Malky, that's that's amazing, that's amazing drawing. You 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 have to be a mangaka when you grow up." And his response was, "What what is this guy talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> and I, I gotta say, man, his his uh, delivery and sense of humor throughout the entire event was was very very funny. Like like. Even without being able to speak Japanese, you could just tell that he's having a ton of fun telling these stories and had a had a great sense of humor about it. And the interpreter did a very good job conveying that as well. And yeah, so some some of the questions that were asked were, were things just talking about uh, like how he works with assistants. And he admitted that he's never been a huge fan of having assistants helping with his work since he wants to have control over it. So with a number of previous projects, he would have had four assistants, where recently with his newest series, Asadora, he's gone down to just having two assistants. Interesting. Yeah, they they, they, uh, they asked, like, so we, we have seen things where like, assistants might help with things like filling in inks or, or doing beta and like coloring in the blacks. What, what, what do you have them help with that? And he said, oh, no, that... That's the most fun part. I like coloring in the hair and coloring in the blacks. I, I, I save that for myself. I help have the assistants help me with things like backgrounds. <laughs> I, I think that's fair, honestly. Yeah. And yeah. You, could, you could tell that he has a, a certain sense of pride about his work in the sense that he, he will have assistants and, and definitely needs their help to be able to meet the deadlines that he has. But he wants to, he wants to do everything himself if he can. Like he, he certainly wants to get the results that he can produce himself. He sounds very Togashi-like in a way. Mm -hmm. It reminded me also of uh, reading about um, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko, who is the the artist who uh, drew Mobile Suit Gundam: The Origin and was the character designer and animation director on the original series. Where in one of the Origin volumes, they mentioned that he drew that entire series by himself without a single assistant. That is Damn. so insane, considering the level of detail in that manga. Yeah, I, I don't even know how he managed to do that, because it's such a long, detailed series. Also, there are some great anecdotes about um, how, how Urasa comes up with his ideas for, for stories and artwork. So they asked him, so where do, where do you come up with this stuff? And he said, well, a lot of the time I come up with 
some of my favorite ideas when I am sitting in the bathtub. So I'll just be sitting there soaking, and then, and then, oh, oh, I, I gotta write this. But I can't, because I'm in the bathtub. <laughs> Or otherwise, uh, when when asked about like like, like so that that'll be like story ideas. But then when it comes to some like art ideas, they said, he said, "Oh yeah, a lot of art ideas act for me for like specific panels or, or pictures will come to me when I'm cleaning." But sometimes it's not not always easy. So I'll just I'll start cleaning my room and I'll keep cleaning and cleaning and nothing's coming to me. And then eventually I'll just look down and my house is entirely clean and I still don't have anything drawn. <laughs> I, I I have I have to be honest. Uh, earlier, I was expecting you to say he comes up with his ideas while while in the bathroom, and I was I was gonna lose my shit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, he's also asked about how so many of his stories are so complex and have plot points that will be set up and then paid off several years later. So things that things that are just very very detailed and and interesting and. That's one of my favorite things about his work, especially with with like like Billy Bat has things that will pay off years later, and it's incredible. And when asked about that, he said that well, I don't even know how something's gonna to turn out all the time because if you think about it, I write series that are around twenty volumes long a lot of the time, and that means seven years or so of serialization. And if you're drawing something for seven years. You have to keep it interesting for yourself. You can't just come up with something and then stick to that for the whole seven years. You have to surprise yourself on the way to keep it entertaining to work on. So he said that there will definitely be things that he'll come up with that will change as the series goes on. And also part of his process when coming up with a main story like that would be to visualize like a, a trailer for a movie full of all of the coolest scenes you could think of. And then hmm. take that and extrapolate that out into a story. So he specifically gave an example from the very first chapter of 20th Century Boys, where after you have the, the scene with Kenji playing the record, and then uh, he said that he was sitting in the bath one day and he heard someone on the radio say, oh, without these men, we wouldn't have made it to the 21st century. And he thought, oh, I want to know who those men are. I want to know what's, what's going on with that. <laughs> but then also he'd come up with the he'd come up with another idea for in the the trailer in his mind of a teenage girl being woken up from her sleep in the middle of the night and then running over to the window pulling it back and seeing a giant robot walking through the city and that that was something that really stuck in his mind so he he drew that in the first chapter and he didn't really he said he didn't really know what it was just yet like that was something he put there and he knew that he would get back to it and that's something that is paid off in volume 22 of 20th Century Boys. It's shown in the very first chapter, but it doesn't happen until volume 22 out of 24. Wow. And you also find out, like, who that character is and stuff, and he hadn't planned out who that character was yet. He drew her in there, but didn't decide who she was going to be until later, which is incredibly ironic considering... That character is on the very next page of that first chapter as an infant. Wow. That's crazy that Urasawa just puts in these seeds of ideas that he doesn't know what he's going to do with yet, but then figures it out as he draws and, like, as the story like, naturally evolves. But he's able to reintegrate all these, like, seeds that he set up just so seamlessly back into the story and make it feel like he's had it all planned out from beginning to end. When really, like many other mangaka, he's making it up as he goes. That that's not something anyone can just do. Mm-mm. Yeah, and I know that uh, in the interviews he's mentioned how he, he's worked with an editor for several decades now, uh, Takashi Nagasaki, who was the co-author of Billy Bat, but also helped with planning on several other works, such as like Master Keaton and Monster and Pluto and Twentieth Century Boys. So the, in uh, an interview that was done for the, the 20th Century Boys live-action movies, he mentioned that Urasawa will come up with all of the, the major plot ideas and like, like the, the general arc and the characters, but uh, every now and then Nagasaki will come in and help to flesh out a few of the smaller details to help make things tie together. So it's, it's neat to see how he's worked with this man for almost 30 years now and is able to, to come up with things like that. Yeah. The, oh, so uh, there, uh, one of the other people that, that asked him about things talked about how he's been reluctant to work on digital, like to have his manga released digitally. So far, 
the only things of his that have been actually released digitally were a uh, one shot that came out last September, and then also his current serialization called Asadora. Other than that, he's been a big opponent of digital re- releases. And while he didn't mention anything about why he's actually relented, which I'm assuming is mostly just business pressure from the publisher, he did talk about how, and this is something that I think is very interesting, like, like one of the reasons he prefers print manga so much isn't necessarily just the feel of the paper or something, but it's the fact that you have two pages right next to each other in print format. So you'll have you'll have like two individual pages, and you'll you'll be reading through them and reading through the flow of the manga. But then you get to the bottom left hand corner of a page, and that panel has to be the most important panel of the the two pages because it's the one that makes you want to turn the page and find out what's next. So he said that over the course of a twenty page chapter, you have to recreate that feeling ten times. You have to you have to come up with a an interesting panel that wants to propel the motion of the story forward. And then he also talked about how, with that, you can lead into a two-page spread, which can have this enormous impact. So he, want, he said that you want to be able to turn that page, and then when you have that on like a, a cell phone and reading digitally, you don't get that same impact from, from turning the page there. You might get half of the image and have to swipe over to see the other half, or turn the phone to landscape mode to be actually able to see it. So he said that, yeah, that, that was a big portion of it. Yeah, it's a different format, so it requires like a different way to create manga. Mm. I saw other people who I think were at the event tweeting about that, and I, I I'm, I'm very mixed about that because it's like I, I totally see where Ursa was coming from, and I think, I think that idea is totally valid. Like I, I see where he's coming from, where it's like, you know, if I'm reading something in print, like I, I, I like that feeling of kind of like transitioning into a huge two page spread from from the previous page and th- that that is a really that's a gratifying feeling and you know as as much as I prefer you know collecting my manga digitally nowadays mostly for like shelf space and whatnot or lack thereof like it is slightly annoying where it's like you know obviously when I'm reading manga digitally I'm 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 reading it a page at a time and then when it's like clearly I've gotten to a two page spread I have to like turn my phone and everything and it's like I I can I I kind of understand that feeling because it's kind of like it doesn't really like take me out of the experience. Like personally, just speaking from my own personal experience reading manga and comics, like you know, I don't necessarily have much of a problem. You know, like I I, st- I still get that experience personally. You know, whether it's digitally or print, but like I can see where he's coming from. I guess. Yeah. Reading a manga in print and reading a manga digitally are two different experiences. And so the same story, when you're reading it in, in those different uh, mediums, you're not going to be able maybe to get the same impact that you might have with print than you would in digital, just because of the way you read using a digital platform by swiping your fingers across your screen or clicking your mouse over to the next page. It's very different from the sensation of flipping the page. And definitely a, a lot of stories, I de- certainly Urasawa stories, are probably not as effective when you're reading it digitally and you have like these moments that Urasawa has carefully made that, you know, you need to read it and where you're seeing these two pages at once and you have this panel like at the bottom left corner that's going to make you flip the page and then I can engage you in this pace and keep you flipping pages engrossed in the story. That's going to be different on a digital platform where you're going to see a single page at the same time usually. And so you have to, you know, focus on having every single page have that panel on the bottom left that makes you flip over. And when you create two page spreads, you have to make them while keeping in mind that a lot of readers will only see half of that image on their screen. and It'll have to flip over to see the other half of the image. So it's like a completely different way of constructing a manga. And so I completely understand like Urasawa's thought process here, why he doesn't think his works would be best read digital. Because like you said, he's making each chapter with these 10 page turn panels in mind, because one per every two pages, 
but like if he were to make a manga for digital only, I, he would need like 20 of those per page because when you're reading digitally, you're reading one page at a time, whereas with print, you're reading two at a time. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a kind of thing where it's a little bit disappointing that he that he would just disqualify things from digital release because I certainly identify with what Colton says in that yeah I I am out of shelf space I I still want to collect more manga but man I don't have the space for it right now and just in general I feel like just at least having the option for digital you know I think would just make for wider accessibility of his works in general yeah it would be more convenient for sure. Like Kodansha USA has been a really big proponent of digital releases, so it's it's sad that a number of the things that they've released digitally aren't available in print format. But they've released so much more than they would have otherwise. So it's 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 it's, it's nice to see that they have this this avenue to be able to print things there. Yeah, di- digital has allowed Kodansha to release things that they couldn't invest in if they had to release them in print. Long series like Ace of the Diamond, Chiyaha, Furu. They were able to do gi- digital first, and like if they had to invest in doing them print runs right off the bat, they I don't think they would have taken that chance because of how long those series are and like how risky that would be. But digital, there's a lot less risk. That's why I like I don't have incredibly high hopes that Yawara would ever be localized recently, like in the short term, because it's a twenty nine volume long sports romantic comedy from the 80s it's that's not a guaranteed seller and that's a big it's a long series to to try to bring out here so it's yeah it's that's a that's a big gamble yeah i would need to have a lot of push i guess in the mainstream like somehow like the western fandom like becomes really aware of yuara and there becomes a demand real big demand for yuara for a publisher to take a chance on it but like as it is, like even with Urasawa's name attached, it is going to be a tough sell because I know definitely, I forget who tried to like since and release the anime over here, but I heard that did not go well. Yeah, Anime Ego did did the first forty episodes and they did a fantastic job with it. It's real, really nice set, and that that's it. The it's forty episodes out of one hundred and twenty four. I think uh, anecdotally, I people just don't know about Yawara in the West, like, at all, despite it running in the same time slot as Ranma One Half and regularly beating it in rankings on TV. Yeah, I mean, it was a big deal. Like, it inspired Olympic, like, medalists in Japan. Last year, I, I went to a convention and I found a few, like, uh, Japanese fan uh, fan comic magazines. So they had, like, Yawara on the cover. So I, I, I bought them. And it's like, oh, man, this is great to see this artwork here. And you open it up, and there are a few pieces of fan art of Yawara. And then, like, 90-plus percent of it is all different Rumiko Takahashi properties. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of Ranma, a little bit of Inuyasha, and some, some uh, Urusei Yatsura stuff in there. Also, at the same convention, I saw a, a guy wearing a sweatshirt that had Yawara on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that. So I went up and wow. I was like, dude, I love your Yawara sweatshirt. And he gave me this blank stare and he had no idea who was on his sweatshirt. And then... How did you even get that sweatshirt then? <laughs> did someone, did you just find it at like a thrift store or like a bargain sale? Like, why is he like, wearing no, it? Here, here, here it is. Like, a few weeks later... I was just scrolling through Facebook, and I see that a friend of mine who I hadn't talked with a long time liked a post that was one of those, like, pop-up bootleg shirt sellers that said, buy your anime 80s girl aesthetic shirt here, and it was uh... that sh- it was that thing. It was just some pop-up bootleg site that had just ripped an image of Yawara and was selling it on, on sweatshirts. Oh my god. <laughs> they That's just not cool. Like, some generic character? Like, I don't, I don't blame them for wanting it because, man, I think Yawara is, like, peak 80s anime fashion, like, aesthetic. Like, oh my god, She's a like, fashionable judo girl. Yeah. Also, okay, here's something that, that's really, really interesting that I found out was that when they did the when they did like the Blu-ray releases of Yawara in Japan, and they did the complete edition of the manga, which were like 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 volume and a half long and had like all the color pages, Urasawa drew new cover art for all of them, and all of them have licensed Forever Twenty One clothing. Oh my god! <laughs> so really so wow. like if, if you yeah if you look at it, they look more modern. It looks like it, it looks like she's wearing more fashionable 
clothing, and they're just it's really cute and really great seeing that. So it's there was a Forever Twenty One in the same building as our event, but I don't know that that Rosella went there. Can we get Forever Twenty One to sponsor a new Yuwara anime in which he's just wearing like all their clothing line? <laughs> Can, can we can we give Forever Twenty One to uh, to sponsor a, a, an actual release of the manga? That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I, I, it was so funny because I didn't even realize like how that happened until I like I have a few copies of it in Japanese, and I just was flipping through the back mainly to see like the credit page, and I just see like copyright Forever Twenty One. Like, what, what the hell is this? <laughs> huh. <laughs> oh, so but yeah, like, getting back to just the the actual interview. Um, one of the, the questions that was asked from the audience was how his current serialization is a series called Asadora, and it, it stars a female protagonist for the first time in a while, aside from like Mujirushi, which was about a year ago that had which had a female protagonist, but it was a single volume. He said, Yeah, you've you've mainly had like male protagonists for a long time. What what was the, the impetus for that? And uh Urasawa said, Well, I was drawing Mujirushi and I, I had uh, Kasumi-chan here, and she was just so cute and so much fun. It was a breath of fresh air, honestly. And then he, he goes on to say, I, I've been drawing all of these terribly stern male protagonists for a long time, and they all had this face. And he, he like immediately, like he had a projector out uh, so that you could see his drawings there, because he was doing live drawings throughout the event, doing like little demonstrations of technique. And he draws starts drawing this like uh, this face... With the the eyes, the eyebrows, and the, like the the jaw and everything, and he, it's funny because if you look at it, that could be it could be Kenzo Tenma, that could be it could be it a little bit like Kenji, but it could also be Kevin Yamagata. He it's a similar face. Yeah. And he said, "Oh, I've been drawing this this stern face for so long," and I thought, "Man, I have looked at these grumpy eyebrows for way too much time." <laughs> <laughs> And then, but then I, I thought, oh man, I need to make these characters more manly. So I'd add like stubble on them and add a little mustache, and he like adds that on as he's going, and <laughs> that was great. And then he just talked about how with with uh, the new series he was drawing Asa, the the protagonist of it, and he's just like, yeah, she's just she's fun. And with with that series, it seems as though it's going to be one that's going to span several decades, just like like Billy Bat or. Or 20th Century Boys, so so it's like, hey, this is a Shogakukan series, so Viz Media, you can please, please, please license that. Yeah, please, Viz, more Urasawa series. Oh, that'd be that'd be nice. Then someone else uh, asked about. Oh, th- this is this is great, actually. When I was standing in line to to take a seat, there was a, an elderly woman who was probably in her 70s or 80s. There had a, a denim jacket just absolutely covered in one piece pins. <laughs> and, wow. and and like she was talking with with with, with me and, and other people around us and she she didn't actually she doesn't like hasn't watched one piece or read it she just went to some event once and they were giving out one piece pins and they didn't stop her from taking more so she's just like oh cool <laughs> i was gonna say that did, did she that she come up and was like excuse me are you oda <laughs> <laughs> well, i love one piece. Draw Luffy. No. <laughs> Draw Chopper. No, not modern Chopper. Old Chopper. He was cute at. <laughs> she, she turned to my father and I, and we were standing there. She's like, so, do you know anything about this man that we're seeing speak tonight? And... <laughs> <laughs> and it turns she she apparently she just goes to any event that the Japan House puts on. She just goes to everything they they do. So if she and she was a, cre- a creative person who uh, like worked like and done like uh, like speaking at, like all over the country in decades past about creativity and artwork and things. So she was just very excited about artwork in general, and it was great talking with her and hearing how she had no knowledge of Urasawa at all prior to the event, but was just very excited to be there. And she even, she asked a question to him about um, what the importance of the artwork versus the story in his works would be. So whether or not there would be like a 50, 50 split in importance there. And it was really interesting hearing his take on it because what he said was for him, the story is of the utmost importance. The artwork is there to facilitate the storytelling. So he views the way that he draws as not that he is drawing the story 
outright, but that there are characters that exist that are actors within the story. So what he's doing is he's drawing the actors acting out the story, and it kind of flows naturally. And there will be even times where it feels like it's not even his pen that's that's moving. Hmm. Yeah, which that also does remind me one of the things that that Urasawa has done in in years past is that he's run a documentary series called Manben, mm-hmm. where he mm-hmm. goes and he speaks with other mangaka and will film them working on their uh, on their practice. So it'll be. Uh, like filming them for a day or more at, at at work and then commentating over it with them in person and just talking about their art. So he's worked with amazing artists like like Higashimura, the, the artist of Princess Jellyfish, and uh, Kengo Hanazawa from I Am a Hero, Inyo Asano, Takao Saito, Junji Ito. It's yeah. just uh, mm-hmm. there. It's unbelievable seeing the different types of of talent that that are on display there and how all of their processes for creating manga are so different and none of them are wrong they're just using different techniques and methods and tools to create amazing works of art mm, there was definitely a point on i think on the show where we used to talk about that show quite a lot oh, man ben is mm-hmm. uh, just amazing I, I i hope that that it's something that that he'll continue because i know that there were about three seasons of it and it would be wonderful to be able to see him speak with more artists about that Mm. Mm-hmm. I think the only I think the only episode I've actually watched in full is the one with, the one about Takao Saito. I remember that one being really interesting. I, I need I need to watch the rest of that or whatatever's out there. I, I guess. know I, I mm-hmm. haven't watched that episode myself. I've seen the the Asano one a few times through just because I've I've shown it to to people, especially because I know a lot of people who who love Asano's artwork, and it's it's just incredible seeing how he does all of that. It's also incredibly stressful seeing the scene where he's like inking a page with a cigarette in his hand and, lit. and I'm like ah, keep ah, keep that away from your manuscript please please oh, gosh. <laughs> he's the master uh, on the edge oh Takao Saito a real man's man uh, but yeah yeah and then so I think the last and fi- like the final question from the audience that that was asked which was one that I it's like man I didn't want to be the person to ask it so I'm glad someone did was oh no how do we get more of your work localized. There's there are so many works, and uh, he specifically brought up Dancing Policeman, which was like a single volume work that uh, Urasawa did before uh, Pineapple Army or Yawara. Pineapple, wow. he, yeah, he brought up Dan- yeah Dancing Policeman, Yawara, and Billy Bat, and he said we 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 love your artwork. We would we would really want to be able to support it here locally. How how can we see about having that happen? And he started off by saying, well, the the important thing really is talk to publishers like like make your voices heard make it known that the fans want to be able to read this it's something where like even mentioned throughout the exhibit it says that urasawa does not bend to commercial whims he draws manga that he wants to draw and i that that's why i love him so much he it's his his stuff is unique that's also a bit of a handicap when it comes to a market that involves localization because the amount of work that needs to be put in to localize a manga is a lot higher than other mediums. Like, even anime, like, you can you can have, like, simul subbing of an anime so much easier than it takes to do, like, manga, because you can you have to deal with lettering and, and redrawing and things, so... and printing. So, it's it's a work-intensive medium. But he, he said that, yeah, definitely just make your voices heard and speak up to it. Talk with the publishers. Also, then he he went on to say, yeah, and call call your local representatives and call the White House. That would help out. <laughs> <laughs> the best part about it was that he, like, since he was speaking in Japanese, no one like the, there was actually there were quite a few people in the audience who spoke Japanese, and they they were able to like laugh and react to the, to things in real time before the the interpreter got around to it. But we were just hearing him talking in Japanese for for thirty seconds or so, and then we hear White House. <laughs> <laughs> like before anyone even like we're like, like we're, how can this possibly play into what he's saying <laughs> that, that's pretty that's pretty funny yeah so like, like and i i say that with all sincerity man we if you love urasawa please talk with publishers and, and or, like make it known that we want to read his works here Please convince them to, that we want Billy Bat. We are long overdue for Billy Bat. 
Kodansha USA, you have the opportunity to publish the greatest manga of the 21st century, in, in my opinion. But, 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 but you have that opportunity. Please don't pass it up. Yeah, start tweeting at Kodansha. I'm, 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 sure the, I'm sure they'll hopefully listen. Oh, man. I, I can't imagine that it is a cheap series to license. I, it, it, like, Urasawa has to be one of the more pricey mangaka to, to license work from. I, I definitely <laughs> understand that. So that's that's a sticking point. And so Viz would not be able to license Billy Bat like they have his other series because it's it's a Kodansha owned property. It's the one series that he did outside of Shogaku Khan. So that that's a bit of a barrier because like other series that Viz would have the opportunity to license easily, such as uh Miyawara or Happy, those are series that would be tough sells for the American market, whereas Billy Bat is a really easy sell. It's it's his thriller kind kind of format, which is what sold well enough that they've done a second entire release of Monster and 20th Century Boys. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, hopefully those sell well enough to where maybe they'll, I don't know, maybe maybe somebody will uh, be convinced in publishing actual newer English works over here. I don't know. Maybe one day. Yeah. But then, finally, to wrap up the event, this is what uh, I hope I've been hoping for now Kurosawa went over and picked up a guitar. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because he is, on top of being uh, an unbelievably talented uh, artist, he's also a, a musician. Oh, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, Frederick Schott had like mentioned when I spoke with him like, like briefly, but also at the beginning of the event, was... Naoki Urasawa is proof that God does not distribute talent equally. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh my gosh. So, uh, for those who aren't aware, the song uh, in the manga 20th Century Boys, there's the song 20th Century Boy by the band T-Rex that plays a big part in the story, but also the main character Kenji writes his own song that he titles Bob Lennon, because it's a shameless ripoff of Bob Dylan and John Lennon. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Urasawa even bundled a single of that song written and sung by himself with one of the volumes of 20th Century Boys in Japan. Ah, mm -hmm. that sounds amazing. Um, he's released two full studio albums already and has announced that a third will be coming sometime this year. So he goes up there and he sang a new song that he'd never sung before, like never recorded before, called Red Berries that will hopefully be on his upcoming third album. And like he started singing that and playing it, and then set down his guitar, and there was a loop playing of a repeated riff from the song. Went over and drew an image live of like an angel standing in the forest with snow and red berries and a, a fat bird, and drew that, and then went back to singing the song. Oh and my god! It like like, and the interpreter also read like spoken word translations of the of the lyrics of it, and it it's it was wonderful. That sounds amazing. But then, following that, I I think it was safe to say that many people in the audience, they were hoping for Bob Lennon, and he <laughs> did not disappoint. He goes up there, and he mentions, so so this is Kenji's song, and I, I know you've all, you, you've been waiting for it. And towards the end of the of the song, there there's a repeated segment where where it goes, gu ta la la su da la la. And I want you all to sing along with that. So he, he goes up there, and very similar to what he had done with the, the Red Berries song, he he starts playing the song on, on his guitar and does does a repeated riff, goes into that, and then it plays a recorded loop. And then he went over and drew a picture of Kenji and wrote, Thank you, L.A., and went back to it and sang the song, and we got to the, the, the final portion where it was the repeated gutalala, sudalala portion, and the entire room was singing along, and it was a magical event. <laughs> that's, am that's just wonderful. Oh my god. Like, what an experience. Wow, yeah. And, like, I, I myself, I actually... I, purchased a CD of that not long ago where uh, Urasawa put out a CD where it was the original song 20th Century Boy by T-Rex, then his recording of Bob Lennon, 
And a third song, which was a club remix of 20th Century Boy that is not very great. <laughs> but the the cover of the album is a piece that he drew himself where it's a riff on the, the album Revolver by the Beatles. So it's got the black and white like collage of faces. But rather than being the four Beatles, it's Urasawa himself, Kenji, and Mark Bolin from T-Rex, repeated over and over again. And... I have listened to that CD on repeat in my car for months now, and it's it was just, I don't even know the lyrics of the song and what they mean, but I can sure sing along with them, because, it, oh man, it was so great. Wow, I'm going to have to look for those CD. I had, I had no idea he was a musician at all. I learned something new today. It's insane that he has time to record music and put out albums while drawing manga. Like, he is incredibly talented. He did mention that during his work process, he does keep a guitar right next to his desk, so he'll if a, a song idea pops into his head, he will just bounce right over and uh, like, like start strumming it and play it and record it on his phone, and then, <laughs> then go back to drawing manga when he's done. Wow. That's a really good idea. When he's getting kind of tired on one of his creative aspects, he can transition into another and mess around with that for a little bit before uh, going back. So that's actually really smart. Yeah, he also he also said that every month he plays a show in Tokyo that's about two hours long where he just goes and plays guitar. Oh my god, he's doing monthly shows in addition to making albums and drawing money? Well, how does he have time for this? Oh my that gosh. Was, I, was, I was just about to say, I wonder if he does live shows like, um, like Takeshi Konomi from uh, Prince of Tennis. <laughs> <laughs> What, one of my, my dad's takeaways from that when we were, like, walking after the event was, man, so so is he married? And I said, I don't I don't think so. I don't, I have never heard anything about that. And then he said, yeah, like, he seems like such a workaholic. He does, like, there, there's no way that he ever stops working. He is someone who has been drawing manga for close to 40 years now and just keeps, keeps on going, never stops, and has an enormous work ethic for it and is a bit of a perfectionist and yeah it seems on one hand it seems a little bit i don't i don't want to say sad because he certainly seems like a very happy fulfilled person just you'd be worried it's like i don't know that he has a whole lot of time for for friends or family or or, or things but he's also had such an impact on so many millions of people mm-hmm. i was gonna say i mean as, as long as he's happy doing what he's doing you know yeah it seems like Urasawa is living his dream. He's, like, successful in all the areas he wants to be. Mm-hmm. I, I, to sum it up, I can't express enough how much of an impact he's had on my life. He's created works of art that have just just changed me as a person. I think one of the things that I have always found within his works is an underlying sense of optimism. And that's something that, that I think people could argue but I, I won't have my mind changed on that because there is such a, a strong sense of empathy and compassion for other people and trying to figure out not just that there are people who are evil and want to hurt people, which he's got a very strong understanding of what modern evil is. He gets to it, but he, he wants to show that there is good within people and that there are there's reasons behind all of these things, and there's reasons to hope. Master Keaton is an episodic series that nearly every single chapter in the, the full, like, 18 original volumes is its own story. And within each of those 24 pages, he can show how you can create empathy for a character and even in tragedy find beauty and hope. And that's, that's something that I really appreciate. I do too. Urasawa is just an amazing artist, and I'm so glad that you were able to see him live in person and get to have such a wonderful experience at this event. Yeah, I mean, I was, um, I, I was, I was kind of following your trip a little bit on Twitter, and honestly, like th- this event just sounds so like, I mean, not 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 that it didn't seem like fun, you know, from what you were posting about it, but it just. I I just I just wasn't expecting uh, some of the things you were coming on to talk about. Like it, you, it just seems like you got so much more out of it than uh, than 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 what you were like posting on Twitter. Yeah, I I'm not great about 
the keeping things updated super fast. So I, I, it was in the moment a lot. There, were, I mean, I met some really great people there. It was it was actually very funny. Um, one of the people that I was talking to mentioned that he he's like, oh man, I, I actually have a, an animation cell from Yawara. Wow. And I was like, oh, that is that oh is so God. awesome. Like, uh, and I mentioned how like last year I, I bought an animation cell from Gundam Eighth MS Team, which is my favorite Gundam series. And I said, yeah, I, I got this. I got this. Uh, this Gundam Eighth MS Team animation cell from a from a cell dealer in the Midwest at a convention. And he he looks at me. He's like, wait, Midwest? <laughs> Was it Kurt? And sure enough, we bought our cells from the same dealer who goes to all of these same Midwestern conventions. <laughs> wow. wow. We, and we bought it at the same convention, uh, NakaCon in Kansas City. Mm. Small world. It wow. was, and yeah, the guy had lived in, it lived in the Midwest and moved out to California a few years ago. So it's like, wow, I cannot believe we both know Kurt, the, the anime <laughs> cell dealer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty neat. I uh, coincidentally at that convention where I had gotten the Gundam cell, I had asked him, "Hey, do you have, do you have any cells from Yawara?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, no, we don't get those very often. People don't buy them." And I'm like, "I would, I would buy them, <laughs> please." <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it 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 sounds like you had an amazing time, and I am incredibly jealous. Well, hey, if you want to meet another mangaka, Junji Ito has been announced as a, a attendee for the Crunchyroll convention later this year. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh man! Uh, but I'm I'm really glad you were able to come on and um, and talk about this with us. I, I feel like I learned a lot about uh, Urasawa. So yeah, no, I'm glad I'm glad to be able to to talk about it. Like it, it means so much to me, and I I really enjoy sharing things like that. Well, I guess whenever we actually get around to talking about any Urasawa manga, we know who to call now. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely love to to join in on any discussion. I love, I love his manga so much. Got a Pluto anime coming out next year, hopefully. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes, I forgot that's about gonna that. Be great. Hopefully. But no, yeah. Um, thank thank you so much for coming on, Aiden. This was this this was a really fun chat. Glad to be here. Um, and I guess uh, you know, where where can the could people find you? I I know you're on Twitter. Yeah, I own Twitter as Koi Boy B Boy. It's like Cowboy Bebop, but misspelled. So, <laughs> yeah, that's where you can find me. C O Y B O Y. So you know that that's wacky. That's 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 quirky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I think I think we mentioned on the on a previous episode um, that uh, you know if you're in the Los Angeles area and uh, you have a chance to go see the exhibit, it's at the uh, Japan House. And um, I think the exhibit is running, like we said, until March 28th. Yeah, and there'll be some other events in the coming weeks. There's like this character drawing for kids event on February 2nd and March 2nd. Uh, there's elements of character designs and for manga and comics on February 2nd and March 2nd. Compositions and panel layouts. Uh, Koma Wari for manga and comics on February 9th. And Kara and Kara Kutcher, your caricature is a manga character on February 9th. So uh, keep an eye out for on those dates to attend those events as well. I guess, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm sure we'll 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 have this episode up like way before the event's over. So you should have plenty of time to maybe plan a trip, uh, just in case you're interested in uh, going to see it. And I want to maybe make a trip out to this before it leaves Los Angeles. Unless I plan to go to London, which is where it'll travel to next. But, yeah, it sounds like an amazing collection of Urasawa's artwork. And I want to see, like, some of the chapters of his work that they are displaying on there. I mean, unfortunately, just speaking for myself, I know I probably won't really get to go see this event anytime soon because uh, of time and money. But So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we could have Aiden on so I could kind of live vicariously through him. <laughs> <laughs> 